Hey, welcome to the PM Mastermind, a community for product managers to get advice, share advice, and build relationships. Today, I'm super excited because we have a session on managing your psychology. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. You know, one of my greatest challenges as a PM is dealing with all the different data and feedback you get and synthesizing it to actually guide product direction. So this topic is very tightly coupled with that. It's sort of what are the habits that you can use to make sure that it's uh, easier for you to actually process all the different information you get and specific types of feedback. So we're going to jump in uh, with our special guest. But before we get to that, um, we'll do some quick intros. So uh, my name is Felix. I'm currently a product manager at Google. I've been a product manager for about five years. Before that, I was uh, a software engineer for about five years, and I used an MBA to actually make the pivot. I'm currently focused on subscription growth for the Google Play um, market. And uh, I joined this community, started this community, because I struggled as a PM initially. And it really only got better for me when I started connecting with other PMs, sharing best practices and learning together. And I wanted to facilitate that for more people. And this community has been a great place to do that. We have over 10,000 members on LinkedIn now, sharing advice, sharing articles, tips, best practices. So I encourage you to join us. Akshaya, would you like to do an intro next? Yes, of course. Thank you, Felix. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Akshaya, currently a PM at Wish, working on AI and ML solutions on content understanding for the supply side of the marketplace. Um, sort of like Felix, I am a hardware engineer turned product manager. I took a brief stop in project management before I pivoted to product. Um, and same as Felix, I primarily joined this community to connect with others sort of going through the same um, journey in their career, trying to figure out product and navigate product. And I'm very happy to be a part of it um, and helping kind of drive the same for others in the community. And we can go forward with introducing our special guest today. His name is Rohan Raji. Rohan is a director of product at LinkedIn, focusing on products that help LinkedIn members find jobs. He also writes extensively for his blog, A Learning A Day, where he shared a learning every day since 2008 and his LinkedIn newsletter, Notes on Product Management, where he breaks down product management best practices and frameworks for over 36,000 subscribers. Welcome, Rohan. Um, do you want to share a little bit more about how like your career has, at LinkedIn has grown and what you're working on these days? Sure. Nice to meet you and thanks so much for having me. I think when I share um, sort of my story, I always start with what matters to me and that's contribution, relationships and learning. And I think of those three words because um, in my case, I think, you know, I had a couple of experiences early in life. I lost my dad and my uncle when I was young. And these kinds of incidents really shape you in fundamental ways, right? And so in my case, it was a realization that life might be shorter than you think. And if that is the case, I wanted to contribute as much as possible uh, and as meaningfully as possible. So that's where contribution came in. And then there was this also realization that people are all we have at the end of the day. And if that is the case, then I think this notion that relationships matter, uh, I think is something that has stuck with me. And so kind of grew up uh, in the South of India and I was very fortunate to get a scholarship to do engineering in Singapore and spend most of my time there building out a student job portal startup. And as you can imagine, the themes of contributing positively to the world, and in this case, actually working with a bunch of people who I thought were very interesting kind of really brought me there. The startup didn't eventually work out, learned a lot through lots of ups and downs. And during that period, also realized that I think uh, you know, just chasing contribution in itself is can can be a very unhappy path. And I think what I thought was maybe if I started sharing the journey or started writing about the journey and writing about all the failures and stumbling blocks, maybe I'd learn to look at life from the point of view of somebody who can you know learn and be confident about everything that's happening. And that's sort of what led to this blog and led to writing for 15 years. So that's sort of how contribution relationships and learning kind of came together. I spent a few years as a management consultant as I wanted to find my way to the Bay Area and work in tech. Uh, you know, also did an MBA um, and, and sort of wanted to find a company where I could put, you know, bring all of these things together. And LinkedIn was very high on the list. As you can imagine, job seeking, startup, um, sort of passion for learning, all of these things kind of came together. And over the past almost seven years now, I've been working on a bunch of products in the last four years focused on the talent marketplace 
and uh, you know in the past six months kind of been focused on the job seeker experience and also working on skills and sort of our helping job seekers share interest to companies and in some ways going back to that problem from 15 years ago right so uh, that's why I sort of keep coming back to this notion of contribution relationships and learning in many ways those words um, and that mission hasn't changed and I think really excited to be tackling this problem here um, at LinkedIn right now. Wow, that's amazing. Thanks for sharing that story. Um, you know, I, I think it's cool to see that tie-in for you. Not a lot of people sort of have that consistency. So that's really exciting. Um, so we're going to start off by jumping into some questions that we sort of have planned for you based on your article, Managing Your Psychology, which we will link in the description of this, uh, this episode. Um, and then we'll also, we tapped our community to see if they had any questions on this topic as well. So we'll end with sort of some questions from the community members, and then we'll wrap up at the very end with a rapid fire round, um, just some fun questions for you. Um, so to kick it off, right? You know, this one really stood out to me because as I look at all the different content, there's a ton of content out there on product management. You yourself write a lot of content, but managing your psychology as a topic really stood out to me, right? So I'm just curious from your perspective, you know, what does it mean to you managing your psychology and why did you choose to write about this topic in the context of notes on product management? Cool. Uh, overall, one of the interesting things about writing this newsletter, right, is that I've been focused on kind of sharing notes and sharing notes means um, bringing together thinking, learning frameworks that might help others. But in some ways, the process is also somewhat therapeutic, right? It is also to help myself synthesize what's happening in my head. And a significant part of the newsletter, 80 to 90% is focused on actually being good, getting good at your job, right? And obviously that matters a lot. You want to have, uh, you know, the grounding of the skill set, the tools required to do the job well. But there's a, a significant part also about feeling good while doing it. Because I think if we, you know, it's very easy to rabbit hole. PM can be a pretty lonely job, depending, you know, in, in so many different circumstances. Um, it's a leadership, it's a de facto leadership role in many companies. And yet it's a leadership through influence kind of job. And so I think maintaining your psychology and sort of being able to rise above the inevitable noise and help create clarity from ambiguity requires, I think, all of us to be real masters of our own psychology. And I think that sort of, it sort of came from that, right? And it's, uh, and, and I think it, to your point, Felix, I don't think enough is written about it. I don't think I've written enough about it. I think this is just uh, one post of, I think, many to come. But the idea was to start the conversation both uh, and, and synthesize, I think, a few notes in my head as part of the process. Did that help? Absolutely. No, thank you for that. Yeah. And I, and I definitely agree, you know, as, as I started my community, I think one of the biggest reasons people flocked to it was because I posted a few times about, Hey, product management can be pretty lonely. And it, you know, it was kind of like a, a signal to everybody to come join the community. Let's have conversations. And there was a lot of energy for that. So I definitely agree. Um, you know, the, the idea of trading notes and, and the importance of this topic. Um, so jumping into the specific article, um, you know, you, you start off very high level, like there's two stages of, of processing feedback, right? So one is like talk to a human, two is spend time with yourself. You know, can you walk us through kind of like the talk to a human piece and, and kind of why that's important? Yeah, so one way to kind of abstract and, and really sort of move up into what exactly is all of this about? And if I had to sort of bring this down into three words, right? I would say the words would be synthesis, reflection, and perspective, right? I think it's all of these three things come together to make it easy for us to manage our psychology, right? And so when I go from there, and the reason I say let's start with that is because then it's easy to put the specific, these specific pieces in context. So let's take feedback, right? We get a ton of feedback. Uh, a lot of the feedback might be on product, right? We might get feedback from user research, we might get feedback from you know, an upset customer, we might get feedback from an executive, we might get feedback from team members. There's, there's no lack of sources of feedback, right? And that's on product. It's almost easier to triage feedback on product. It's much harder to triage feedback to do with your own working style or when somebody says they're upset with you about something. 
And so I think that synthesis process can be different for different people. Right? There's no question. There are some people who do a great job thinking on the feet while receiving the feedback and kind of making sure they're problem solving. Others need the time to take it, absorb, mull it over, and then kind of come back with like, okay, great, now here's, here's my point of view. For a lot of people, something that works is speaking to some another human. And there's something about that that's therapeutic. And I literally call it therapy. I think a big part of a manager's job is providing some amount of therapy, right? And and I think um, and I I think it's just sort of whatever helps you with the caveat and with the awareness that for a lot of people speaking to somebody helps because I think when that happens, that helps us remove the emotion involved with such feedback and helps us better understand: is this feedback about me? Is it about the process? Is it something reflective of how the, the person is, you know, the, like their own reaction to something that happened? And it's very hard to, you know, really bring or really shed light on any of this in a straight conversation. It often requires some amount of processing in the background. And then I think it results in sort of a simpler synthesis, which is essentially like, okay, great. I got this feedback once I took out all of the emotion that led to X, Y, and Z. That's going to help me move forward. And sometimes the synthesis may be, I won't do anything with this feedback, right? I'm, I'm, I've, I've, I've processed it. I don't think it's reasonable and I move on. In many cases, feedback is, so feedback tends to be between 1% and 99% accurate, right? And it's up to us to figure out how, but that process of doing so is, is, is sort of where the synthesis comes in. And that's sort of where the talking to the human uh, piece comes in as well. Makes complete sense. I, yeah. I love that you, um, like introspection or self-reflection on what's coming your way is definitely very important. I just love the way that you break it down into like steps to say, hey, do one step versus the next, like kind of like before proceeding. Um, and I also love that you mentioned kind of going to your manager, like almost for therapy. I'm fortunate enough to have a manager who I can, let's say, go to and have an open, honest conversation about, hey, how things are going and even how I'm feeling. Um, but in the past, like, I've had different kinds of manager who all managers who approach um, how they kind of work with their employees very, very differently. And sometimes they like it, it, this can't be very easy all the time. So I, I guess a question uh, along the lines of the reverse of like, Hey, what are some reasons a manager might not be the right person to go to when you're looking for some of that feedback or that therapy? And if you are facing a situation like this, what advice do you have for PMs who are trying to still receive that feedback? Awesome. This is a big question. And I think the way I'm going to start is I'm going to start with a story that's going to feel very orthogonal. So, 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 so bear with me. Uh, over the past years, right, thanks to both this newsletter and also obviously the community of PMs at LinkedIn, I've gotten a great opportunity to have a lot of conversations with people as they've been considering career moves. Right? And, and it's a very fascinating conversation because you know, they're always weighing a bunch of options and they're weighing a bunch of priorities. And typically, right, like it comes down to, you know, some notion of problem of like what problem area do I want to work on? Some notion of product, like for that problem, I think this product has the scope. It can, you know, I think it has a great future. It has, it's the right priority within the company. And then there's stuff around people, right? I like the cross-functional team. I like the PM team. I like the manager and so on. And what's really interesting is different folks obviously have different priorities, right? Some folks are looking at better scope, some folks, some folks are looking at some mission-driven problem area, some folks are looking at people, etc. And my uh, general framework here is to say, hey, what are the top two things that matter, right? Because it's like very easy to try to do a multivariate optimization, which never goes anywhere. And, uh, and people always choose, you know, something and something, right? After some portion, some discussion. And... I think over the years, I've seen one very clear pattern, which is whenever one of those top two things isn't the manager, right? The chances of success of that person in that role are actually significantly lower. In fact, like I think I just did like very rough math over the years, and it was nearly 25 to 50% of cases of folks who, especially who said, I don't know about the manager, but I think the scope is really great. Or I think this is really great. Like it almost never worked out. And it never worked out about half the time. And 
In the case of people who actually did the opposite, where they said, hey, I actually don't know yet if the scope exactly is right as it sits right now, not quite sure of the future part, but but I really trust this person, right? And I feel this person has my back. Great things happen. And so I go this sort of a very long-winded way of saying, A, and, 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 and by the way, the reason for that is that having a great relationship with your manager and having a manager you trust results in a lot of good things that you cannot predict. Right? And one of those good things as well as part of that package is the ability to have honest conversations about things that are working or not working. And I think it's just such a huge part of the job, right? Because ultimately you're making prioritization decisions all the time. And it's firstly hard to do that and make change, especially in situations where change is required without the backing of your manager. And even then when you do it, things are inevitably going to go wrong. And if you're not able to have those conversations, it's actually any leadership role becomes really, really challenging. And I think that's why in a sort of a product management role where you have to lead with influence, having that sort of relationship with your manager is key. All this gets back to you. This is why I said it's a bit of a long diatribe, but like that gets to your question, like what happens when that's not the case? I think to the extent possible, try to make sure that is the case or at least find another role where that is the case because it is going to be key for success. Now, of course, that's an easy thing to say. It's not always easy, um, you know, to uh, to make that call, right? It's, you know, so we're in a tough market right now, for example. I think fundamentally, though, that question kind of comes down to like, do I trust the person or not? And if you've given trusting the person a shot and you feel it doesn't work, then it's time to figure out your exit strategy. And if you have given it a shot and you do trust the person, then go all in, right? And have that real conversation because this is just a relationship. It's the one relationship in the com- in any company where you are incentivized to make each other successful. So I just say make the most of that. Awesome. So at this point, we've covered uh, sort of what you referenced in your first uh, habit for uh, being better at managing your psychology, which is you know, the habit is getting the therapy you need, right? And we talked about, you know, you spend, it helps you spend time with somebody else to help you kind of process, remove emotion, helps you spend time by yourself to kind of decide why you need to apply this feedback, right? Um, so I guess the next question, just to make it a little bit more tangible, um, is maybe, can you tell us, maybe if you have an example of when you had maybe a low point but from negative feedback of some sort and you sort of had to process um, and parse it out? I mean, there are so many of them, right? It's not, I'm sure you can reflect on your your own experience. It's not one low point. It's many, 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 many low points, right? And I think even when I look at the past few months, I think I, you know, there have been multiple instances where I've gone to my manager. I've also gone to my cross-functional partners, right? often my engineering partner, my design partner, um, and also sometimes to members of my team, right? Where we've been like, hey, this just seems completely out of whack. I think I keep going back to that notion of synthesis, then reflection, then perspective, right? And I think the reason I think that matters is because it's that first step of synthesis that's really hard. Because sometimes you're hit by something and you feel emotionally hurt. Uh, That's when it's just like, it's very tempting to react and do something rash. When I think the most important thing is to take the time to figure out, like remove the emotion from it and figure out what the real issue is. Because sometimes it's magical, right? Sometimes you, at the heart of what might be a brutally delivered piece of feedback, lies a gem that, you know, changes how you operate, that helps you transform, you know, what you were doing or change your operating style in a way that's pretty transformative. But I think like you kind of have to go through that process and, you know, one of the best piece of advice I've had is like, you know, if you're rushing to, to type something or say something that you know is going to be harsh, like just wait 24 hours, right? And give yourself that time to kind of synthesize, like get, like reflect on it just a little bit, get some perspective before you come back. And I think it's, that happens so often. And I think what I will say, something that's helped for me personally, kind of beyond talking to all of these people, which helps a ton too, is just writing. I write every day. And I think something about that exercise of something about that habit and that practice of writing every day helps clarify these things in my head. And there's a great kind of like, you know, a little anecdote there. The, the word essay comes from the French word essayer, which means to try. 
And some, you know, when you write the ideas, when you write long form in any way, shape or form, you're trying to figure something out. And often, you know, whenever I get something, whenever I have a bad day or whenever I have something difficult, I just try to write out what it is that I'm feeling, what it is that is going on. In many ways, what happens is that is sort of the self therapy, right? Where you are able to take, take, take a pass, take a break, uh, and really kind of process that and get a better sense of what is underlying all of that. That then helps, I think, you know, helps me at least reflect and then kind of get some perspective and then move on. Awesome. I think, you know, we spend a lot of time on habit number one, because I think it's definitely like a very, very critical piece, sort of like you said, that synthesis, how do you, how do you do that effectively? Um, but you obviously also mentioned a couple other habits, right? One of which is, you know, kind of sort of always thinking about how can things go right, as well as how can they go wrong, right? So you're always sort of thinking about what are some ways that this could go really, really well, and I have that optimism, but I'm also like, what could go wrong, and I can correct it. And you have another habit, which I want to talk a little bit more about, which is, you know, the last one around having investments outside of work, right? Where you're, you're learning or you have hobbies or, you know, things like that. Um, and I think one thing that stood out to me is you sort of talk about um, the, the up and down sine wave, right? We talked in the beginning, you could get feedback from a number of places, right? UXR comes back and the concept that you worked on for months is really showing well, you're going to start building it, you're excited, the team's excited, woohoo, you're at the top, right? And then, you know, maybe a director sees it and they ask about button placement and some very specific design element and they're like really criticizing it and now you're feeling super low, right? And we, you talk about kind of smoothing out those ups and downs, right? And, and sort of having perspective and, and the idea that these outside learning opportunities and hobbies that you have kind of help you maintain. Look, the job isn't everything. There's, you know, there's highs, there's lows, but it, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be very extreme. Now, what I want to ask about is some people might read that as, Hey, I, I want to like kind of temper my excitement and, or I, I you know, I, I don't want to get too excited about things or I want to kind of keep things like very level and steady, but they might read that as like kind of removing yourself from it a little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit about like kind of what you meant around, you know, you don't want the highs to be too high. You don't want the lows to be too low kind of thing, but it doesn't mean that you have to be like a stoic person about work. I want to hear maybe a few more thoughts on like how you see that part. Yeah. I think this is an interesting one, right? Because I think to start, let's start with the problem first, because I think this is the problem that, uh, they, that that's sort of worth digging into. I think one of the challenges that we can easily run into, right, if is sort of emotional volatility, right? And what I mean by that is like kind of exactly what we talked about, the sine wave or the yo-yo life in some ways, right? Like everything's awesome, everything's crap, right? Like, you know, and, and it's very easy to go through that, right? It's like everything's awesome to your point. The data validates my idea, right? It's awesome, right? Or the MVP ramp is doing great. You know, VP criticized the idea. Like everything's bad, right? And like it's like it's so easy to go up, down, etc. And I think fundamentally, it makes for, um, especially if you're thinking of yourself as sort of somebody who's playing a leadership role within a cross-functional team, and soon in a group of cross-functional teams, it's very hard to deal with such sort such emotional volatility, right? Because who you, how you feel and how you show up has a profound impact on everybody else's day, right? If you show up in a bad mood or down, your entire team could be in a bad mood or down. They could feel that you've lost faith, right? So I think it's a first like taking ownership of, of sort of the responsibility that we have, right? When we work with a cross-functional team uh, and to work, and when we work in general, we show up as professionals to show up in a way that is constructive and helps move projects and things forward. So I think once you keep that in mind, then the question is, what's the best way to do that? And I think there's a couple of little analogies, right? So one analogy uh, a friend shared with me once was that it's kind of like an elect, you know, an EEG rating on your heart, right? You want, you're going to have lots of ups and downs, right? But you don't want it to be too high, which means you've got something really bad happening and you don't want it to be flat, right? Which means you're, you're, you're no longer alive. But you're going to have lots of ups and downs and you want to keep the amplitude of those swings small. And that's the idea. 
And I think the reason that matters, and the you know, there's a story that I share in the article that I'd love to share again here is this notion that you never know if a good day is a good day. And I just love this story because it's a story I've shared with myself and with others many, many times. Right. So I was interviewing this person. Uh, he was a venture capitalist. He's a venture capitalist. Um, and during the conversation, I had asked him, and this was oh, more than a decade ago, and I asked him, you know, what is a learning that has changed your life? And he said, you never know if a good day is a good day. So it sounds intriguing enough. And I asked, well, you tell me more. And he shared the story where he had done his PhD, started a health tech kind of biotech company way, way back when. This was in the 1990s. And you know, the company was doing well. They decided to get outside investment. And, you know, in those days when you got outside investment, they basically removed the entire management team and brought in adult supervision, right? So they did a wonderful transition party. They celebrated. It was a great day. And then uh, 10 years later, this person was trying to take over a company in, uh, in the Midwest, worked on the deal for months, probably nine months or so. And then it fell through kind of three days or four days before it was meant to close. It felt like a horrible day. And then he said, like, now let me tell you what those days look like from today's vantage point, right? The adult supervision came in and ruined the company. So in reality, that great day was actually a horrible day. And then on the flip side, that company that I didn't take over didn't work out, but then I ended up getting a great opportunity to become the president of a small book market, bookmark left called Delicious, you know, then, you know, sold it to Yahoo made a bunch of investments and then became the venture capitalist that I am today and it changed my career and transformed my career. And I think the takeaway from all of this is that it's so easy to be excited about this up or this down. You don't know how these things work out. So it's best to kind of keep keep calm and keep plugging away. And in, in time, good things happen. And that's the spirit of this, right? Is that you don't know like today is up versus tomorrow is down. It's just very hard to know. Uh, you know, how these all play out in the grand scheme of things. I think we're much better off trying to keep those amplitudes small, acknowledge it, kind of do exactly what we've talked about, right? Synthesize it, reflect on it, but like keep some perspective that in the grand scheme of things, things work out fine. It's best that we keep focused on moving on and, and keep plugging away. That's at least the spirit of it. I hope, I hope that explains. That definitely does. I feel like throughout this conversation, I've learned a lot. Like you've dropped so many gems. So it's definitely been very enlightening to hear um, you speak on this topic. Um, I know uh, that's basically the end of our kind of set of questions that we had, but we also do have some that were pre-submitted by the community that we'd love to get your thoughts on. Um, so the first one is you mentioned the importance of keeping perspective through your, like through having like hobbies and interests outside of work um, that don't necessarily tie directly back to work. So do you have any advice for, let's say, early career PMs who are still kind of trying to make their mark in the field or in their company um, when it comes to actually managing work and life outside of work? And does that advice actually change if we're not talking about early career PMs now when we're talking more so about PMs who are more mature in their career? It's a great question. I don't think it changes, right? And I think it doesn't change because of a fundamental truth, which is that I think learning is integrative, right? So what that means in that is that, you know, we learn and get inspiration from so many different things, right? And just like, I think one of the interesting things about expertise, right, in general, in studies around expertise, is a great, it's a very interesting book called Range, which talks a lot about this notion that in many, many, many fields, right, it takes a long time before you kind of really decide to specialize in something. You almost have to like expand your range and, you know, expose yourself to many different kinds of experiences before you bring it all together. So even as like a fundamental career strategy, I think it's like helpful to have creative inspiration from many different places versus like assume you're just completely one dimensional in which all you're doing is working. I just don't think that's, um, that's productive, right? In, in the midterm and the long, in the long term either. So. I don't think the fundamentals of that uh, perspective change changes. I think it's both because it helps you get perspective outside of work, right? Like you're going for a walk with a dog, for example, or going and playing sport. Like all of this kind of triggers just, I think, different wiring in our brain and helps us think through problems 
um, I think in ways that we, it's like hard to fully appreciate. So, so as I said, so I don't think that changes. I think there's a second part of that question, which is how does that change when you're early versus later? I think what's, what's interesting about this is, and maybe I'll answer this in two ways. The first is, I don't know if the challenge changes. Like I think fundamentally, like I think this notion of balancing work and life is a little bit of a misnomer, right? Because I don't think you're ever balanced. You're always balancing, right? And I think the way I think about this is that it's better to think about it as trade-offs, right? It's like a work-life trade-offs because the trade-offs are very real. So I, I have right now, uh, we, have, we have two kids. We have a, a five-year-old and a six-and-a-half-year-old. And I have a fixed amount of time, no matter which way I cut it. And ultimately, an extra hour spent at work is an, is an hour subtracted from time at home and vice versa, right? And we, my wife and I, have to partner and make the right trade-offs because the trade-offs always exist. An extra hour here versus an extra hour there. Like we're talking about 168 hours and how I allocate my time amongst them. And we all do that. No matter where we are in a career, we're always making these trade-offs. I think the only thing we can do is to make these trade-offs intentionally and consciously because, uh, you know, th th that's, that's what we have in our control. But I think there's also sort of a, another perspective here, which is that I think it depends on what the goals are, right? So if, for most people, I don't think the goal is just do well in this job, get promoted. The longer term goals are, you know, to do with learning, like to continue to grow as we proceed as, as individuals, as professionals. And I think like one equation I think about from a learning perspective is that kind of, so first think about it this way, who we are today, the difference between who we are today versus who we are 10 years from now is just fundamentally our rate of learning. And uh, there's a more geeky equation here, but I can let me give you the, the, the simple thing, which is like, I think the rate of learning kind of comes down to our ability to learn from people. Like, you know, we get synthesized information from people. Our ability to learn from books or articles or venues where we have synthesized information or our ability to reflect, right? So our ability to go through, if, if you and I went through the same experience, but you reflected a lot more from that experience, you probably learn more. That if you and I met different people, you met people who are learned and have great mental models and, and frameworks, it's likely that you will just be better, right? And then uh, similarly with sort of synthesized information, right? the quality of the books you read and the quality of books I read makes a huge difference in our ability to learn. So I think that's sort of, I think thinking about the rate of learning in all of these places basically means that our ability to expose ourselves to different kinds of people our ability to expose ourselves to different kinds of input and information and our ability to find sort of avenues outside to kind of let our brains reflect, to kind of dwell on things, to, 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 to synthesize, to, you know, take the right things away from it. I think all of this helps us just learn and become better. And I think if that is the goal, then I think like that advice uh, or that perspective, I think holds regardless of whether you're one year into the job versus 10 years into the job. Absolutely. I think, you know, for, that balancing time experience, uh, 160 hours, I mean, that's all we get, right? So you just kind of have to make the trade-offs based on what your goals are at that time. So that, that makes perfect sense. All right. So we have one more question from our community before our rapid fire round. So from the community, uh, you mentioned also, you know, building habits, right? So we talked again about, you know, all the different habits that help you synthesize and then act on different types of feedback. Um, you know, what strategies or, or what strategies or techniques do you have for PMs who want to develop effective habits as a part of their, their day job? At this point, I think um, given the success of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, I've heard so many people uh, sort of uh, recommend the book to me. I haven't read it myself, but I'm like, I think a huge, I think it turns out that uh, there's a lot of people who are very inspired by it. So maybe there's like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to say anything that is like uniquely insightful, but I'll tell you what's worked for me. I think what's worked for me is picking one area or one habit that you can go after and just sticking to that habit. Right? And we talked a little bit about writing, but so that's sort of how this notion of writing every day has become just foundational to me, to who I am as a person. And I think the ability to do something every day over a long period of time 
has just built more confidence in my ability to do it in another sphere in my life, right? And so I think this notion kind of, I think the way I think about this is like, you know, the word integrity comes from the word integer, which means whole, right? And so as a person, the question is, how are you whole? You're whole when you say what you will do and you do what you what you say, right? And so the challenge we have in habits is that a lot of us do not have belief in our integrity, right? So if I went back 15 years ago and I said, I'm going to start exercising tomorrow. I don't, I, I didn't, I didn't believe myself fully because I didn't uh, have faith in my ability to follow through. But now if I want to pick up a new habit, I look at myself and say, I'm clearly capable of doing something every day, right? So then it's much more of a problem solving thing. Do I not believe it's important? Do I, am I kind of picking the wrong thing? Like there may be other kinds of factors, but it won't be because there's some limiting belief that I have about myself. And I think what I found is that of all of the things, right? I mean, you can do, there are tons and tons of techniques, finding other people who want to do it, like finding a peer group, you know, no matter what habit you want to pick, you know, accountability buddies, start doing something small, etc. But fundamentally, I think it's an identity question. It's like, it's a question of, am I committing to be the kind of person that does that? And, and to get that confidence in our identity, I think it helps to pick something almost doesn't matter when that something is clearly like epic writing, but pick that something, do it consistently. And over time, we just get more and more confident that we can go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it's much easier to build off that foundation. Yeah, I love that. You're definitely touching a lot of the key points from, uh, from Atomic Habits. Uh, a little bit of, uh, I would say, probably getting things done as well is I also like that book. So maybe we'll link those uh, in the notes. I think those are some good references for folks. Um, all right, so with that, we'll get on to the fun part, our rapid fire round. Um, just some fun questions to just to hear a little bit more about you. So the first one is read versus TV slash movie. Oof. By myself, read with uh, my with family probably movie okay okay so let's go with the read um last book you read that you would recommend i'm actually reading a book right now it's called oh god it's kevin kelly's latest, uh, latest book um it's great advice for living or something like that kevin kelly is a is a is sort of a futurist who's been kind of dishing out some phenomenal life advice like very pithy so that's been really fun. Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of reading that right now. The book that I've completed, I read Unreasonable Hospitality by Will Guidara. Uh, and this book was uh, about their time bringing 11 Madison Park, which is this restaurant in, in, in New York, to kind of basically the pinnacle of hospitality success and how they did it, like their approach to doing it through unreasonable hospitality. I think it was very inspirational. It's just like, took, I think, I think took so many notes from it, so many notes on um, leadership, on customer service, on innovation. It was, it was a wonderful book. Awesome. That sounds great. Definitely add those to my list. Uh, do you do audible audio books or physical? Yeah. 70% audible, 30% physical. Yeah. I'll yeah, add those it's a to mix. my audible list for sure. Um, all right. Next question. Uh, beach versus mountains. Oof, really, really hard. I'm, I'm very torn. I think, uh, ever since I moved to the US, um, I love down, I've like picked up downhill skiing. So I love, love, love going down to the mountains and also love the beach. It's like, it's an impossible question. I think I'm going to lose either way. So I, I love both. It just depends on time of the year and what I need. All right. Well, then you got to do both. So last time you went skiing at a place you recommend and last beach you visited that you recommend. Um, so when it's, uh, we were, we're very, we live three hours from Lake Tahoe, so we're very fortunate. So we went just a month and a half ago, always recommend it's beautiful and, uh, beach, you know, I last went to the beach actually in December when I visited a uh, home in India. So we're from, the, from South India and we went down to the beach because we live, uh, near the beach in Chennai in the South of India. So. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. That's a good one. Okay. So last time you used generative AI tech and what for? 
I've been using it a bunch, right? And so uh, I think uh, I think uh, I think one that I've used I mean use I've been using it a lot for various travel planning. So I organize a bunch of travel, you know, for our family in various ways, and I think this sort of like give me the one or two day itinerary for this place or this thing. It's been pretty amazing. That's a good one. I've actually heard that use case recently. I haven't had a chance to try it yet, but I think I have a trip coming up, so I'll give it a shot for uh, for Jamaica. Um, okay, so last question. Favorite product and why? And it doesn't have to be like if you were in an interview. Like really, what's your, what's your favorite product and why? <laughs> you know, I, I have so many. Uh, I mean, it's like hard to, as you can imagine, that we kind of, walk around looking at various user experiences. I was so inspired. I went to Disneyland for the first time a month ago and I was just blown away by the, the thought given to the various details of the user experience, right? It's just, it's been amazing. Uh, I think one, one product that I am very grateful for on a weekly basis is I have a Xiaomi Roborock, which is an odd, you know, one of those automatic, um, uh, you know, Roomba type robots. Um, and what it does is both uh, vacuum and mop, which is not a, which is a, which is a rare uh, combination. And it does it pretty well. I've been using it for a year and a half. I love it. I feel grateful for it every Sunday or Saturday. Whenever I run it, it's like two and a half hours and kind of gets the home to like an 80, 90% level of cleanliness like in one go. Uh, and it's just, it's amazing. And so there are products like that. I think in general that sort of, are either thoughtful about details, kind of like Disney, and uh, or just remove a ton of friction and grunt work. And I think this, uh, I think Roborock definitely definitely hits that 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 note. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Rahan, so much for being with us. Thank you for sharing all your insights. Uh, you know, can't wait to share this one with the community. And we will just wrap up. But before we do that. Uh, you know, feel free, let the community know how they can reach you, you know, where to find you. Any, uh, any last words? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think, I think the newsletter is probably going to be the easiest way because, uh, well, as I say that I haven't been, I haven't written as much in the past, like nine, nine or so months been busy with a project, but I'm looking to get that restarted. So I think the LinkedIn newsletter, I would definitely say would be the first port of call. And I'm also fairly active on, on LinkedIn. Obviously, uh, I, you know, I share often updates on some of the latest products that we are shipping, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, pretty easy to find. I think for any questions that you do not want to share on LinkedIn, I'm on rohan at rohanrajiv.com. So you can just reach me on email. Awesome. Well, we definitely will link your newsletter so folks can subscribe, your LinkedIn, so people can follow you and get updates, as well as your email. We'll also link the specific article that we sort of talked around today, which was uh, managing your psychology. So thanks again. And um, with that, you know, this has been another session of the PM Mastermind, a community for PMs to get advice, share advice, and build relationships. We will see you next time. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Product Management Mastermind on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcasting platform. And remember to leave us a rating and review so that we can reach more listeners. We appreciate your support. Thanks.